I'm Richard, and I would like to talk about the fall. The plan here is to help you navigate the often seemingly challenging back catalogue of the fall. Well, I say seemingly challenging, but in many ways the fall are completely impenetrable. And as the 40-year journey of the fall is in parts a tale of stubbornness, doggedness, and maybe a touch of madness, my attempt to summarize their discography should come under the same heading. Vocalist and lyricist Marky e. Smith, the only constant in the fall, was one of the most profound and funniest writers in popular music, but also one of the most elusive to pin down as well. So I'll make no claim to unravel all that Marky e. Smith is contributing, but hopefully make it sound appealing, intriguing enough that you'll want to find out for yourself. He calls on an endless amount of literary and pop culture sources to highlight his own life experiences, his constantly evolving view of the world, while predominantly grounded in Smith's home location of Prestwick. For us non-Mancunian listeners, the bleak Northern English depictions are as evocative as Carson McCullough's, Carson McCullough's Gothic South, Philip K. Dick's off-kilter Future Worlds, or Ray Davies' London. And Marky Smith deserves his place within any of these writers. The traditional fiction writer may be more trapped in plot and continuity than Marky Smith ever needed to be, but in music, so much can be communicated with tone and a selective lyric. So yes, Marky Smith deserves to be mentioned in the same breath as the great writers, but does so in a different medium, a medium whose vocabulary Marky Smith has helped to extend. Smith's confounding contributions are matched by the labyrinthine mess of tracking down 40 years of full recordings. There are live LPs that have a couple of exclusive studio tracks, Peel Sessions, Janice Long Sessions, all released on a mind-bending number of labels, many of which don't exist now. So my focus will be the 32 main LPs and many of the standalone 45s. There are too many high points on the LPs to bring them all into focus, but I will try and at least shine a light on a track or two from each. If that gets you started, you'll soon find others. So going to the beginning, the Britain that the fall arrived into in the mid-1970s was an economy that had been falling behind mainland Europe since World War II. The early 70s oil crisis shattered the mirage of a robust economy and triggered large-scale unemployment and crippling inflation. Bored, frustrated, and without opportunity, for a teenager this was the perfect cocktail for the back-to-basics and do-it-yourself ethos of punk rock to emerge. Manchester was a city that probably looked the same as it did in the 1940s with about the same entertainment options. Before punk, it is not that there weren't artists coming from the greater Manchester area, Herman's Hermits, The Hollies, 10cc, but before punk, the city played second fiddle to Liverpool in the domination of the Beatles. So, when Pete Shelley and Howard DeVoto scheduled the Sex Pistols to play the lesser free trade hall, only 10 years after the reactionary cries of Judas were thrown at the newly electric Bob Dylan in the larger free trade hall, they ignited a powder keg of new ideas and music in Manchester. In the wake of this, Una Baines, her then-boyfriend Marky e. Smith, guitarist and singer Martin Brammer, bass player Tony Friel, and eventually drummer Carl Burns, met in Una's flat and plotted their attack. Tony Friel labelled this new cohort The Fall, from the Albert Camus novel, The Outsiders had already been taken. Originally intending to be a guitarist, Marky e. Smith moved to vocals and Brammer focused on guitar. Baines was on keyboards and Friel, the jazz band, on bass. Although they started in 1977, there were false starts and delays before anybody would hear the fall on vinyl. The first opportunity to hear the fall recorded was on the now famous Short Circuit Live at the Electric Circus 10 inch. The fall's two tracks, Stepping Out and Last Orders, appeared alongside Buzzcocks, Warsaw, about to become Joy Division, punk poet John Cooper Clark, and the forgettable Drones, all from the Manchester area and Birmingham reggae band Steel Pulse. Released in mid-1978, it was an inauspicious start for the fall. They had already recorded four tracks, but they sat shelved, unable to get a release. Finally, Miles Copeland, older brother of Stuart Copeland, later drummer for the police, in August 1978 put three of those almost one-year-old tracks out on his Step Forward label as the Bingo Masters Breakout EP. This is the only fall release to feature the original fall lineup. Recorded in the maelstrom that was punk, the fall had the attitude and the rudimentary musicianship to ride its coattails, 
but they stood out because of Marky e. Smith, a literary autodidact who related more to the working class, hard drinking men and women he grew up with than to the art school left wing that had birthed a lot of punk. A lot of the decisions the fall make over the years that can seem perplexing make sense in the context of Marky e. Smith's relentless work ethic and adherence to the values of the working class. His love for the Velvet Underground featuring Lou Reed's literary lyrics had shown him that no topic was outside the scope of a smart enough lyricist. In the confining dictates of 1977's amateur ethos, second track Bingo Master stands out. The tempo changes, add more power, and hidden behind his Johnny Rotten barking, Marky e. Smith's tale of a bingo caller having a breakdown is unexpected and note perfect in his use of bingo jargon. It has the feel of a Twilight Zone episode when described, but with none of the Twilight Zone's campiness the show has acquired over time. There's a grave somewhere only partly filled, a sign in a graveyard on a hill reads, Bingo Masters Breakout. Track three of three on the EP, the dirge-like repetition, was used in live performances as a long outlet for whatever bile Marky e. Smith's spleen needed to vent. On record, it was more focused, the references to then-current leaders, President Jimmy Carter and Chairman Mao or Richard Howell's blank generation, are jarring. But rather than date the song they place it in, and place it in the now-distant past, it fits perfectly into the often surreal wordscapes that will become Marky e. Smith's stock in trade. Kay Carroll, who would take on the role of fall manager, had previously been a psychiatric nurse, and this had enough of an impact on Marky e. Smith to make the lyrics. The song is a declaration of intent. This is the three R's, the three R's, repetition, repetition, repetition. Kay Carroll's arrival as manager was enough to squeeze out fall founder Tony Friel. Una Baines left at the same time, so we have Mark Riley taking over bass duties and the young, youthful Yvonne Paulette on keyboards. Second single, It's the New Thing, is a Marky Smith, Martin Brammer co-write, the catchiest release to date with a frantic rhythm propelling the song forward with an often adorable cheesy keyboard motif riding on top. Marky e. Smith is still in pseudo Johnny Rotten style delivery, but in 3 minutes and 28 his lyrics bring in Devo, The Untouchables, Houdini, Glam, Manchester Punk's The Worst, science fiction films and the declaration that The Fall Have Never Sold Out. Two singles in, Step Forward released Live at the Witch Trials, the Fall's debut LP produced by Bob Sargent, who would later be more closely tied to the two-tone record label, producing the specials, the beat, Madness, and Dexy's Midnight Runners, amongst others. He would cross paths with the Fall more closely when he worked for the BBC and the infamous Peel Sessions. On Live at the Witch Trials, we have 11 tracks with ex-members Tony Friel and Una Baines showing up with some writing contributions. At this point, the fall was still close to being a democracy. That would not last. The lyrical subject matter includes violence, both implied and actual, the bleak oppressiveness of the cityscape, drugs and addiction, and the music industry. Two songs stand apart. The first is Rebellious Jukebox, where the first voice you hear is not Marky Smith's, but Martin Brammer's. I'm searching for the now, I'm looking for the real thing. It's a marvellous depiction of a sentient jukebox that rejects being solely designed for human enjoyment and searches for its own pleasure. Two quick takeaways. It is a catchy earworm built on what sounds like the cheapest instruments available, especially Yvonne Paulette's keyboard. Being able to make such enjoyable and often challenging music with the most basic equipment and rudimentary players was a trend that would continue throughout most of the fall's existence. And two, the line made music to itself, made music for itself, is as good a definition of their 40-year journey as any. I sidled up to a fruit machine. And the other track is the title track Live at the Witch Trials, less than a minute long, the first of many spoken word raps by Marky e. Smith, a subtle approach to delivery even if the lyrics are less than subtle, ending with the title declaimed like the cry of Saturday Night Live's opening after one of their cold opens, we're still one step ahead of you. I still believe in the R&R &R dream, R&R &R as primal scream. The second LP, Dragnet, arrived a brief six months after their debut, but there were changes aplenty. The only names who were on witch trials are Marky e. Smith and Mark Riley, 
which allows the arrival of two players who will define the fall sound. Bass player Steve Hanley, who spent 19 years in the fall, and guitar player Craig Scanlon, 17 years in the fall. Marky Smith aside, it is unlikely that we'd be paying the fall any attention today without these two. We also get new drummer Mike Lee replacing Carl Burns. Lee does well and should have played with them more, but he didn't like the long breaks between activity and saw more regular work in local club bands. He's only on this LP in a single. With these positive changes acknowledged, the end result is somewhat of a step back, two steps back, from witch trials, with a muffled, claustrophobic production, but it was the production Marky Smith wanted and he seemed far happier with it than witch trials. That is not to say there is not much to attract you to this LP. The playing is still primitive, but the chance to hear the first steps of the fall that would largely carry them through the 1980s is thrilling, and Marky Smith expands his lyrical palette. Dice Man is based on the novel of the same name. Before the Moon Falls dabbles in pseudo-mysticism. Flat of Angles is a Lovecraftian tale of murder with the LP title slipped in. And the eight minutes of Spectre vs. Rector, while compelling in its own way, hints at greatness still to come. Marky Smith name-checks the author M.R. James, a huge inspiration on him, and still finds room for Ray Milland, Roger Corman, and Caesar. The music has a relentless and effective guitar riff kept pace by a rattling snare sound. Producer was Grant Showbiz. He has been the producer of choice for most of Billy Bragg's career, and he remarkably stayed in Marky Smith's good graces, working with The Fall On and Off till 2013. He is the producer of 10 of the LPs in our discussion today. A Figure Walks is one of the most interesting tracks. The claustrophobic sound, which flattens much of the LP, suits this track perfectly. The image of Marky Smith walking in a cold Manchester winter with a duffel coat where the hood limits his ability to see what might be behind him creates an image of unease that anybody who has traveled on foot through a city at night can relate with. But here there is the added nuance of the supernatural. While Smith was more of an H.P. Lovecraft devotee than he was of Stephen King, this song would fit nicely with the recent HBO adaptation of King's The Outsider. Both send a shiver with the malevolence following them. There's a man on my trail. He's also behind you. Behind you. That figure kept on walking. Behind you. Not done with 1979, the full rollout, a Roush rumble, a standalone 45, recorded at the same time as Dragnet, but far superior to most of that LP. Foreshadowing, Lie Dream of a Casino Soul with its insistent keyboard refrain, here again played by Yvonne Paulette in her last fall appearance. The highly litigious pharmaceutical company Roche becomes Roush, and Marky Smith questions how his personal favorites, Speed and Grass, are stigmatized while addictive prescription medication is accepted. While condemning Speed and Grass, they've got an addiction like a hole in the ass. As 1980 arrived, the fall sound was evolving quickly, quite possibly aided by drummer Mike Lee, who shows up in a fall photos with a teddy boy drape coat. The classic single Fiery Jack is a rockabilly gem, although some sources say Paul Hanley, younger brother of bass player Steve, was on board as drummer by then. So more likely it is Marky Smith tapping into the music he liked, and maybe as a bonus it was the style of music the subjects of the song grew up with. 45-year-old hardened drinkers who had lived a life and every, etch, every inch of it was etched on their faces. 35 years later, Fiery Jack could have been Marky Smith. It's a classic 45. The fall started the new decade vital and miles ahead of the critics who had written them off. I sat and drank for three decades. I'm 45. No sooner are you digesting Fiery Jack when another non-LP 45 arrives. How I Wrote Elastic Man has an enthralling, bouncy charm. It's hard to accept that this was not a hit. They're not in a rockabilly rut. This status quo rewrite outstrips its source in all its roughshod glory. And yes, he sings Plastic Man and not Elastic Man. This is possibly deliberate as Plastic Man was the creation of comic book genius Jack Cole and much like the tortured creative soul in this song, Jack Cole committed suicide. Elastic Man may have been used as the title here to avoid a lawsuit, or like any interpretation of Marky Smith, who knows. A creeping wreck, a mental wretch, everybody asks me how I wrote Plastic Man. The band was so prolific at this point that one of the Fall's best-known songs, Totally Wired, was never on an LP, 
Another 45 only release, the simplest of drum patterns, the first of many chant-along choruses, and Marky e. Smith keeping the lyrics as accessible as possible. Without compromising their sound in the slightest, the fall made something that should have turned every teenager in 1980 into a fall fan. Although Marky e. Smith has been quoted as not enjoying singing Totally Wired, he is also bemused that this wasn't a hit single. It did make the top 25 in New Zealand, so there is that. You don't have to be weird to be wired, but if your pulse doesn't jump when the bass and drums synchronize at the 30 second mark, you probably shouldn't be listening to the fall or maybe music at all. The thing that holds the fall apart, and for all my harping on them deserving hit singles, they do live in the weird, at least in contrast to the mainstream. The same weird where Captain Beefheart, Can, The Velvet Underground, and all the other great weirdos live. The morning light, another fresh fight, another row, right, right, right. Which leads us to November 1980 and the first Stone Cold Classic Fall LP, Grotesque After the Gram, a huge leap forward from Dragnet in both songwriting and production. Grant Showbiz again, with help from Rough Trade boss Jeff Travis and Red Crayola Perubu avant-gardist Mayo Thompson as producers. If you hadn't been tracking the breadcrumb trail of great singles from Dragnet to Grotesque, the advances would have been a huge shock. But listen to those standalone releases and you can see the path from Dragnet to Grotesque. This is where the potential of Marky e. Smith's lyrical genius blooms. All the concerns that have inhabited Smith's world so far are present. The decaying environment he lived, the failing of British bureaucracy, drugs, the working man, and the genuine terror that lurks in your placid neighborhood. And, of course, the sorry state of the music industry, amongst others. It wasn't just Marky e. Smith making leaps forward. The musicians are starting to create a new language with the fall. The apparent simplicity of the playing can be disarming. They create music of real depth and the perfect complement to Smith's own complexities. The music is always servant to the song. The idea of ego was, and always would be, anathema to the fall. The title of the album, well, after a gram of whatever Marky e. Smith was putting up his nose, you too would look grotesque. The wonderful cover art was by Marky e. Smith's sister, Suzanne. Since keyboardist, since dragnet keyboardist Yvonne Paulette was gone, the rare occasion of an all-male fall is what we're left with. The track, English Scheme, we enter the world of an English work scheme as we slide into the early 1980s Thatcher-Reagan recession, a work scheme being hard labor for the unemployed. If you ever watched the English 80s TV show, Our Fweetism Pet, you can picture what Marky e. Smith is talking about. Struggling at home to find work, hearing about opportunities overseas. The clever ones tend to emigrate, like your psychotic big brother, who left home for jobs in Munich, Rome. He's thick, but he struck it rich. The music is led off again by the keyboard riff, this time played by Craig Scanlon. Considering how catchy the song is, it takes a few listens before you, listen you realize there's no real chorus. He's the freak creep in us all. If I had to pin down, pin down what my favorite fall song might be, C and C's Mithering would be in the running. Let's start with the title. Mithering is the easy part, Mancunian slang for complaining or moaning. C and C is, is an abbreviation for cash and carry, a low budget grocery store where you pack your purchases to save money. While cash and carry mithering, what cash and carry mithering means and how that elusive hanging S fits in, well, your guess is as good as mine. Various live versions or the Peel Session version have completely different lyrics. Like repetition before it, it becomes a launch pad for all manner of Marky e. Smith's visionary words of wisdom. In the grotesque version, Marky e. Smith is largely mithering about the sorry state of the record industry. The compelling words are matched perfectly with the guitar riff that builds hypnotically, aided by the simplest of snare drums. They create the perfect platform for Marky e. Smith to rap over. The best of the lyrics are funny and quite possibly profound, which is which, I'll again leave up to you. Californians always think of sex or death. Impression of Jay Temperance highlights Marky e. Smith's enjoyment of H.P. Lovecraft, a tale that captures the Lovecraftian spirit. It's the story of a dog breeder who dabbles in some unrecommended interspecies breeding. The vet who births the resulting abomination rushes from the room in terror and calls his wife about this hideous replica. The bass and drum build the sinister mood with the catchy guitar playing an echo of the vocal line. 
Marky Smith choosing the name Temperance for the mad scientist dog breeder has always seemed an unsubtle dig at those who have the unsound notion of regulating alcohol consumption. Name was J. Temperance. Only two did not hate him. The NWRA, or The North Will Rise Again, is a nearly incomprehensible tale which may or may not be about a fictitious northern English uprising. Roman Totale, one of Mikey Smith's alter egos, first seen on the previous live LP, Totale's Turn, seems to be leading the uprising. Marky Smith loves to change narrators from verse to verse or even in the same verse. Getting a complete grasp of the story is near impossible. I would call it a distant cousin of Talking Head's life during wartime as much as Marky Smith would hate the association. The musicianship in the fall, by dictate, is rarely exemplary. Marky Smith fought hard to keep his musical wards playing as primitively as possible. Yet, despite his efforts, Scanlon, Hanley S., Hanley P., Riley, often create things that are new, stunning, and challenging. The North Will Rise Again is a great example of this, the perfect platform for Marky Smith. Junior Choice played one morning. The song was English Scheme, Mine. They'd changed it and did a grand piano, turned it into a love song. How they did it, I don't know. Four months after Grotesque, we get a six-track, ten-inch vinyl, Slates. Neither fish nor fowl. Is it an LP or an EP or is it a single? I call it an LP in the fall's fourth. And pound for pound, these six songs are some of the best the fall ever recorded. Grant Showbiz produced the game. We open with Middle Mass. The title, a German derivation meaning mediocrity. And when you add that to the rumor that the song is reportedly about guitarist Mark Riley, you can see that things were getting tense in fall land. For the listener, though, any insults are pretty obscure. I.e., this is not How Do You Sleep. Steve Hanley owns the song, his melodic bass playing allowing the guitar and keyboard to construct a perfect counterpoint. The song slowly builds to an intense, hypnotic dirge until the second The Boy Is Like a Tape Loop line when the guitar takes over. He learned a word today, and the words, misanthropy. Fit and Working Again is a wonderful rockabilly tune. As we listen, we surmise that the narrator is not Fit and Working Again. Great song, though. I love the falsetto-like singing on the title, one of the many ways the youthful Marky Smith used his voice to great effect, like the too high to sing squeak he utilizes as his voice breaks. I'm fit and working, dear. It took me ten years to write this song. I'm fit and working again. Leave the Capital continues the fall's rockabilly flirtation. A thundering train of a tune heading north away from London and all that Marky Smith despises. References to Hogarth and the great god Pan muddy the water a little if you're trying to pin this down as a northern sideswipe at London, especially when you make the connection that the Pan reference is from a 1959 Jack Kirby Tales to Astonish comic. The lyrics here have been dissected and analyzed as much as any Marky Smith wrote, and there are some fascinating takes as you head down that rabbit hole, but right now, not knowing that won't stop you from loving this tune. Leave the capital. Exit this Roman shell. Slates did rub Rough Trade wrongly enough to drop the fall, and they promptly signed to Camera, a small independent who also housed the Au Pairs and New York Dolls, not the heavy metal label Marky Smith would like you to think. Lie Dream of a Casino Soul was their first release on Camera, and another of those 45s not released on any official LP, and the second fall release in a row to go top 25 in New Zealand. Somewhat of a connection with English scheme, here the away worker returns home and wants nothing more than to spend his hard-earned Deutschmarks in the northern clubs dancing to northern soul and picking up girls. Whether it is a dig at the club scene or just reportage, this thumping take on the northern soul sound is unstoppable. I'm a bit jagged right now in a tongue-tied, wired state cause Sunday morning dancing. The camera label allowed the fall to follow whatever path they chose, and they made the most of this freedom. The LP, Hex Induction Hour, was the result. This is the big one, the centerpiece of the fall catalogue. They've had more commercially successful releases, more accessible, more high profile, and we're going to create more great music, much, much great music. But Hex Induction Hour towers above them all. 
The late Richard Cook in his glowing NME review, the fall have sealed their isolation. They can never be an influence. Nobody can progress on what they have done except the fall themselves. Live with this LP for a while. It won't reveal itself to you all at once, but piece by piece you'll find a way in, and as the door closes behind you, you won't want to find your way out. A couple of recordings were made in a studio in Reykjavik, hewn out of volcanic rock during a brief Icelandic tour, but the majority were recorded in a disused cinema in Hitchin that had been converted into a studio. The setup had the band often playing far away from the room where the vocals were produced. This is the fourth LP in a row, counting Slates as an LP, with the same lineup. This time, they're augmented by the return of original drummer Carl Burns. Adam and the Ants, eat your heart out. The Fall now has a two-drummer lineup. For the full story of recording this LP, I highly recommend drummer Paul Hanley's book, Have a Bleeding Guess. It's all about recording Hex Induction Hour. The end result for us is 11 tracks and none that need skipping. As Marky e. Smith described Hex as a reaction to the contemporary music scene, against bland bastards like Elvis Costello and all that shit, I'll leave this sales pitch once again with Richard Cook and his enemy review. What they have done on Hex Induction Hour is create their masterpiece. Grant Showbiz Producing with help from Richard Mazda. I've never felt better in my life. The classical is the lead-off track and the power of the two-drummer lineup is the first thing you notice. Then, the sinuous bass that seems to wrap itself around those drums. The stable lineup is what made Hex possible. Tight is one of those overused phrases in the rock music world, but here it's valid, because Marky e. Smith usually does all he can to disrupt any semblance of musical cohesion in the group. That battle between his disruption and their growing maturity as musicians is almost palpable in this song. As angry and bile-filled as the lyrics are, the music is in lockstep with Marky e. Smith. I won't waste time here on that lyric that is going to jar you today as much as hearing it in 1982 did. If you're interested, I'll put the link to a great article in The Quietus on that very topic. You won't find anything more ridiculous than this new profile razor unit made to the highest British attention to the wrong detail. The song Hip Priest is used to great effect in Jonathan Demme's Silence of the Lambs. But it's one of those tracks that seems to divide devoted Fall fans, as loathed as it is loved. I love it. The sound and tension build slowly, showing a level of musical subtlety new for the Fall. Is Marky e. Smith the underappreciated priest of hipness? The blur between author and subject is common in Fall songs. The group reaches new heights in matching Marky e. Smith's intensity with the sparest of accompaniment, becoming powerful cacophony only to slide back to skeletal minimalism. All the young groups know they can imitate, but I teach because I'm a hit priest. Split into two tracks on the original vinyl, Winter, Hostel Maxi, closes side one, Winter two, opens side two. Harking back to A Figure Walks from Dragnet, Winter is Marky e. Smith describing a world covered in snow. More specifically, how alien the world looks during a snowstorm. The familiar becomes terrifying. In Marky e. Smith's Winter, it's not just the appearance of alienness, it is actual. A disturbed child had his mind taken over by a malicious spirit. With the bass and drums holding tight to the repetitive drone, Marky e. Smith talks, sings, while organ and guitar wander almost unconstrained, like the wandering spirit in the snow-covered winter. Entrances uncovered, street signs you never saw. Iceland starts, and you need to remind yourself you're still listening to the fall. The track opens with a cassette recording of wind. Once that stops with a click, be prepared. Nothing you've heard from the fall up to this point is like Iceland. We hear piano, banjo, and Marky e. Smith's slow speak singing. The group seemingly improvising, creating something beautiful and otherworldly. Iceland should be on anyone's top ten fall songs. For something this powerful to have come from supposed non-musicians, improvising is mind-blowing. There is not much more time to go work 15 hours for the good of the soul and be humbled in Iceland. One of the tracks from both the Iceland and Hitchin sessions for Hex Induction Hour is non-LP 45, Look No, a rumbling bass paired with Mark Riley, as he claims, doing his best version of the fire engine song Candy Skin. Unlike his failed attempt on Iceland to sound like Bob Dylan, here he really does sound like Davy Henderson of the fire engines. 
The lyrics have Mikey Smith reacting to the rise of the image fashion conscious new romantics and hacienda devotees. He may not have been able to do this once he had his own Armani sweater. You got to know what you look like nowadays before you go out these days. Hex was out in March, and by September we had a whole new LP, Room to Live. At this point in the 1980s, The Fall and Marky Smith were being taken seriously by not just the all-important British rock weeklies, but also the Oxbridge-educated journalists on the broadsheets. For all Marky Smith's sneering dislike of the self-declared tastemakers, he did like having them gathered at his feet hanging on his every utterance. Room to Live could be called the anti-Hex, the songs for Hex were allowed to gestate, time was taken to record them properly, five of the Hex recordings were worked through on Peel sessions dating back to 1980, live versions for a similar amount of time. There may not be another full recording that was as thought out and prepared as Hex, but Hex sold well. The group received acclaim. Record companies wanted them. They made the English charts, the first for a fall LP. All this disturbed Marky Smith. The fall was in danger of turning into a real group, the musicians were getting competent, so they headed back into the studio and made Hex's follow-up, supposedly just to make a 45, but things started rolling and an LP emerged. There are no Peel Session versions of the Room to Live tracks, the typical proving ground for new fall songs. The musicians were kept off kilter, a trick from Beefheart. Smith would only call in a couple of them at a time and possibly have a newcomer ready to be a part of the session which does give us Arthur Cadman coming in for an audition and contributing guitar to the title track, his only fall appearance. It made for an interesting tour to the Antipodes. They left, there to, they left England to support the album on their first Australia-New Zealand tour. The tracks from Room to Live were featured heavily in the set list. As it had not been released there at that point, some fans complained. They were being shortchanged. Marky Smith quite accurately corrected them. They rarely played the most familiar and older numbers, always pushing forward. He was not patronizing the Antipodean fans, but treating them with the same respect he would audiences in Britain. As the years went by, this proved to be a prescient approach to live performance, and stopped it even being the slightest hint that the fall were a nostalgia act. They were always new, always moving away from the past. Look back bores like myself would have been given little sympathy. At the time of Room to Live, not wanting to be seen to conform to the tastemaker's expectation was a powerful motivator. And with poor reviews on release, and even the musicians who made the LP talking about what a struggle it was to make, is Room to Live any good? Yes, and surprisingly so. And let's face it, anything coming after Hex, and so quickly after Hex, was going to find it tough going. The LP is not as powerful as Hex, and has an almost bootleg quality to it, a basement tapes or nuggets compilation vibe. This was the last LP with Mike R Mark Riley, who had been there since before Live at the Witch Trials. Kay Carroll, credited as Kay O'Sullivan, and John Briley produce. Detective Instinct features a lovely Hanley bass line that is the making of the song. Other instruments appear, but nothing like the clatter we've grown accustomed to, this is the hangover from the full onslaught that was Hex Induction Hour. It's an amazing minimalist masterpiece. The man at the bar had a V-neck vest on. No, it was a V-neck waistcoat. Accurate. Detective instinct. On a U.S. tour in early 1983, Kay Carroll departs acrimoniously. She had managed the growth of the fall from a democracy to a dictatorship. It was her guiding hand that had allowed Marky Smith to develop and define the identity of the fall. She was a huge contributor to the great music they created during her tenure. Guitarist Mark Riley, as I said, is out. The Antipodean tour and Riley's rock star leanings are given as the reason. Marky Smith's American bride, Brick Smith, is in. The LP, perverted by language, their seventh, was mostly done before Bricks arrived, but she is given credit for the LP's more accessible sound, but it was already in place and the tracks she contributed to are not necessarily the accessible tunes. Steve Parker produces, and with the demise of Camera, the Fall are now reluctantly on rough trade again. LP opener is Eat Yourself Fitter, and the twin drum assault was still in full effect here, the twin tom-toms and bass riff relentless throughout the song. The majority of the lyrics are 
stream of consciousness with observational remarks that are not connected, but what you remember is that call and response chorus. Regardless of how serious the verses are, the chorus never fails to bring a smile. Three years later, Elvis Costello's wonderful Tokyo Storm Warning plows the same field, and yes, Marky Smith would be aghast at that connection. I met a hero of mine, I shook his hand, got trapped in the door, felt a fool, I'll tell ya. You're going to hurt your head trying to make anything coherent out of the lyrics for Garden. The various observations can seem otherworldly, but one of Marky Smith's feats of genius is making the pedestrian seem like a message from another dimension. The final, repeated line, a Jew on a motorbike, is a good example of this. One of the fold drivers was Jewish and would claim that you will never see a Jew on a motorbike. In Gold is Green, Marky Smith sees a whole group of Jews on motorcycles coming down the high street, a sight strangely echoed many years later by Larry David in Curb Your Enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. Who? Andrew Bird, my lawyer. Really? On a motorcycle? Yeah. What is a Jew doing on a motorcycle? I never recall ever seeing a Jew on a motorcycle. Do you ever want to get a motorcycle? I was. The musicians play an ethereal melody that allows Marky Smith's words to do their work. Craig Scanlon's guitar refrain is simple and repetitive and one of his best. Listen late at night on headphones in a darkened room. Never since birth, not eaten in a day. Never since courtship stayed up some nights. Tempo House was a song the group didn't feel they could ever get right in the studio, so the version on the LP is taken straight from a live video they recorded at Manchester's Hacienda. Built around a bass riff that could have been lifted straight from Joy Division's Unknown Pleasures, another comparison Marky Smith would have hated, and a drum pattern that would sit well with Can. The song is Marky Smith's take on unemployment and collecting the doll, maybe. The reality, the reality is that these are some of Marky Smith's most, most enigmatic lyrics, which is saying something. References to the BEF, Jesus Christ, and Winston Churchill keep you engaged the whole way. Illness, pollution should be let loose. Then maybe, someone, then maybe some would have a genuine grouse. The Man Whose Head Expanded is the follow-up non-LP 45, and it's a cracker. The last of the four singles to chart in New Zealand. The tale told in Marky Smith's usual, angular, non-linear way is of a Mr. Memory character, think Alfred Hitchcock's Mr. Memory in 39 Steps, who is being followed around by a TV soap opera writer who steals all Mr. Memory's jewels or good thoughts. However, that's neither here nor there. What you need to know is that there is a twin drum barrage, one of Steve Hanley's best bass lines. I say that a lot, but he is an underappreciated bass god. Craig Scanlon's inventive guitar and a synthesizer. Turn that bloody, slimy space invader off. Kick a Conspiracy is the fall's standalone single about soccer hooliganism. Marky Smith is sympathetic to what most viewed as a blight on the game. He pegged the violence to frustration with the way soccer was being managed and the fans were being treated. Listening to the start-stop rhythm, it's hard not to be propelled along like watching Apocalypse Now and its seductive battle scenes. We are conditioned to loathe soccer hooliganism, but this song makes you want to go out and crack some heads. The B-side wings, a thumping, engaging, macabre ghost story is one of the fall's best. Don't miss it. In the booze club, George Best does rule how Flair is punished. His downfall was a blonde girl, but that's none of your business. Oh Brother is one of the Falls' forgotten 45s. Not a classic, but is able to find that rare mid-80s balance of a song that can be both very accessible and also retains its quality. And it's a nice lead-in to the upcoming LP. Steve Hanley's bass line is one that will be whirling through your brain long after the song is finished. I'm not even going to surmise what Marky Smith is singing about, but I love hearing him do it. His almost melodic vocal line almost, pushes the song into mainstream blandness, but even in these circumstances, there is something inherent in a fall record to keep it interesting. The bass line is now the intro to Steve and Paul Hanley's excellent Oh Brother podcast. Listen to it now. Oh little brother, we are in a mess. Don't look at me that way. The wonderful and frightening world of the Fall LP arrived in 1984, and this is the beginning of the Fall's golden period of commercial success. It was pretty minor compared to most acts, but this was their most high-profile period. 
It was also the last LP to consistently feature the twin drummer lineup. The group roster was again the same, with Bricks making her presence, co-writing three tracks. John Leckie produced. He was a very experienced producer, having started as an engineer at Abbey Road and worked on solo LPs by John Lennon, George Harrison, Sid Barrett, and with Mott the Hoople and Pink Floyd. As a producer, he worked on early XTC, Public Image, Simple Minds, etc. The LP was released on Beggar's Banquet. 2x4 is possibly about Brix's estranged father, Marky Smith's new father-in-law. Whoever it is that is, again the rich, again the poor, the song makes you feel like you're on the receiving end of a 2x4. Once again, it's Stephen Hanley's bass that makes the song. 2x4 is one of the first time we hear Brix's vocals acting as a contrast to Marky Smith's, and that's great. He said... Hit him on the head with a two by four. Craigness was a placeholder name for a title that never arrived, named after guitarist Craig Scanlon, who wrote the song. The music is fabulous, a slowly unfolding guitar refrain where the bass just pops in and out of the background. After giving such fulsome praise to Steve Hanley, his partner in crime, Craig Scanlon, deserves a mention. You could argue that not much is asked of guitar players in the fall. Marky Smith doesn't permit anything too flashy, but within the boundaries of Smith's restrictions, Craig Scanlon is a superb player and hugely underrated songwriter. The lyrics are about a flat Marky Smith and Scanlon shared that was about the worst place either of them had ever lived. The downstairs neighbours are scary and crazy. There's also a lyrical reference to T'Pau, a Vulcan from Star Trek. Neighbour downstairs with one eye, cohabs with a mass of blonde curls. Disney Dream Debased was inspired by a trip where Marky Smith gets taken to Disneyland by bricks and they witness a woman killed by a freak accident on the Matterhorn ride. One of the first songs where Marky Smith croons, well maybe that's overstating it, but he does talk sing more melodically. The bass is some of Steve Hanley's most intricate playing and sits behind the guitar that follows the vocal line. Bricks's intermittent harmonies of the word Disney are ghostly and perfect. Though Mickey and Minnie and Br'er and Pluto secretly prayed, there was no doubt at all, no two ways about it, was the day Disney's dream debased. Creep, or C-R-E-E-P, is in the running for the catchiest 45 the fall ever released. A perfect keyboard refrain, delightful harmonies, it has hit written all over it, of course it wasn't a hit. There are multiple remixes but the version you want to listen to is the original 7-inch, which leads in with Bricks reading some lines, possibly a poem. They've been attributed to Sylvia Plath, but I can't find them in, in her work anywhere. Bricks's recitation is a nice contrast to the earworm that follows. One of Marky Smith's more straightforward lyrics, largely reportage as he disparages a German tour promoter. His ugly gawk is offending. Make sure you are not absorbed with hideous luck. He'll absorb all your talk. The fall we're not done with 1984, and in December we get another release, the Call for Escape Route EP. It was a great way to round out the year, even if the buying public ignored it. Drago's Guilt is a short story from Marky Smith with too many pieces missing to make it comprehensible as a plot, but musically makes perfect sense. The winner, though, is No Bulbs, a tale of domestic discomfort, Smith is trying to find a belt in the dark when the light bulbs have burnt out. That mundanity is transcended by Craig Scanlon, Brick Smith's blistering guitar playing. The full fanzine, The Biggest Library Yet, which ran from 94 to 2000, found its name in the lyrics. I'm hunting and trying to find a belt in the early morn when your home is a trash mount. Look all out, over, but you're right out. 1985 started with a thrashy throwback of a 45. Couldn't Get Ahead is pretty straightforward, both musically and lyrically. A thematic cousin to Ray Charles is If I Didn't Have Bad Luck, I'd Have No Luck at All. The B-side is Roland Danny, originally by Gene Vincent, and the first cover version to appear on an official fall release. Before the September 85 release of This Nation's Saving Grace, the fall's ninth LP, drummer Paul Hanley is out. The two-drum lineup is no more. It will reappear occasionally in the future with different players, but for now, Carl Burns is alone behind the kit. Multi-instrumentalist Simon Rogers is in. Rogers is a Royal College of Music graduate and prize winner. 
the most accomplished musician to ever be in the fall. This LP continues the fall's magnificent run during the 80s, a classic. John Leckie produces again. My New House is an example that, for all the obfuscation you can find in Marky Smith's lyrics, more often than not, he is reporting his daily activities. In this case, after a lifetime of renting, Marky Smith and Bricks decide to buy a house. The music, like the whole LP, is compelling and, along with Marky Smith's lyrics, makes even the retelling of the purchase of a new home a tune you will want to return to again and again. My New House is no beatnik hangout. So Mr. and Mr. Smith have their new house. Now it needs to be decorated, and paintwork is Marky Smith being told by the contractor that he is messing up the paintwork. But this song is not the straightforward domestic retelling that My New House was. Marky Smith goes off on many tangents that keep you listening closer and closer to hear what he's saying. The band, meanwhile, lay down one of the greatest ball tunes ever. It's a personal favorite. Everybody excels. Marky Smith was traveling with the original recording on a dictaphone and accidentally sat on the record button, so about 30 seconds in you get a brief snatch of Open University teaching us how to red giant stars make carbon. It's perfect. Brix's harmonies come in for the last few seconds. The song and all its ragged, mistake-included beauty is sublime. And sometimes they say you're messing up the paintwork. Thumbprints are on the paintwork. And sometimes they just say, hey Mark, you're spoiling all the paintwork. A tribute to Cannes' second singer, I Am Damo Suzuki, is quite simply one of the fall's greatest creations. The lyrics are full of Cannes references that are fun to unearth, and even better are the musical references. The song Bel Air by Cannes is almost 20 minutes long, but if you roll to the last 60 seconds, you can hear the melody of I Am Damo Suzuki. And the drum sounds like Oh Yeah, a song that Marky Smith had introduced to Mike Lee in the Dragnet days to get him acclimatized to the fall. The fall's mostly untrained musicians making greatness with an homage to Cannes, a group with some of the most proficient players to work in popular music, is a marvel to behold. There is great playing all over this track, and I would nominate this as fall veteran Carl Burns' best recorded performance as the lone drummer. Trying to outdrum Yaki, the greatest rock drummer ever, brought out the best in Burns. Can we go back to days pre-Virgin? Cannot get clear vinyl. This nation's saving grace was followed by one of the fall's great 45s, Cruiser's Creek. An office party, possibly on a boat, some unspecified tragedy occurs. The guitar refrain is a monster. Bricks may have brought melody to the fall, but she often didn't bring the subtlety, and I mean that as a compliment. This is a guitar riff designed for mass consumption. It must have been crushing for the group to watch single after single not race up the charts. What really went on there? We only have this excerpt. The follow-up, Living Too Late, is 31-year-old Marky Smith imagining life in middle age. Crow's feet are engraved on my face, I'm um, living too late. With so many recent hook-heavy 45s not selling, it was time to try a song with none of the usual pop sensibility, but it is captivating all the time, all the same. The rhythm is tight with drum and bass and a nice symmetry with Marky Smith singing. The falsetto vocal interludes work perfectly. Still an odd choice for a standalone 45 with its introspective theme and music. It has been incorporated into Ben Sinister on some releases. On the 12-inch, there is Living Too Long, an alternate version. The original is the best, but still worth searching out the alternate. Sometimes, life is like a new bar. Plastic seats, beer below par, food with no taste, music grates. Tenth LP, Ben Sinister, takes its name from the Nabokov novel. Drummer Carl Burns was gone again. Paul Hanley stepped in for one track until full-time replacement Simon Wollstonecroft could arrive. Wollstonecroft had almost been in the Smiths and the Stone Roses, both groups having childhood friends in them. He did have a brief time as the Colourfield drummer. Most importantly, he would be the drummer for the next 11 fall albums. This is a much denser sounding record than the previous few. It also featured Mr. Pharmacist, their first cover version on an LP. John Leckie is the producer, his last outing with the fall. Julia Adamson worked as engineer. She would be a fall member in a few years. You can't get more 1980s than Shoulder Pads, and this song is Shoulder Pads 1, and yes, there is a Shoulder Pads 2. Bricks has commented how Marky Smith borrowed one of her shirts and it had shoulder pads. Would have been quite the look. The very prominent 
keyboard motif is going to get your attention and may drive you crazy. All these fads, it's shoulder pads. US 80s, 90s, the fall toured America a lot, and Marky Smith was starting to feel the encroachment of the police state by the mid-80s. They were being hassled at customs, and Marky Smith noticed the freedoms he had enjoyed on previous visits were slowly shrinking. The sound itself points towards the dance-rock hybrid that would be a big part of the fall's 90s releases. Had a run-in with Boston Immigration, and to my name, had an aversion. When an obsessed fan stole the stage backdrop, we're gifted with the genius of Bournemouth Runner. The story of the heist for sure, but musically, after starting slowly with a from-the-deep bass rumble, the pace quickens just like the runners, and we are propelled along by the skipping drumbeat and 60s throwback keyboards. Marky Smith has fun, and we get to join in. Bristol Ball, a runner took back door, exit hall, Bournemouth runner. The only official release from Marky Smith's reportedly shambolic stage play, Hey Luciani, the 90-minute play about the possible murder of Pope John Paul I, 33 days after being made Pope, did not receive good reviews, and there is no footage to confirm or deny it. The descriptions make it sound like it would have been a unique experience, and if Hey Luciani, the 45 is anything to go by, had some great music. A nice blend of acoustic and electric guitars, the four seemed to be able to write these classics in their sleep at this point. They made out you were an ultra-nut and had no time for your Christianity. You paid with your life with their treachery. Six years after Live Dream, the fall take on a Northern Soul favourite. There's a ghost in my house by R. Dean Taylor and have a top 30 hit in Britain. A simple, spare-sounding tune, the most innocuous of songs to become a hit after all the classics they have released. Hit the North Part 1 was recorded during the Friends LP session, but released a few months before that LP. This was the work of Simon Rogers and Bricks messing about with sequences. Marky Smith loved the sound, they added some guitars and a live drum, and the fall have another almost hit. It, a technique that Marky Smith will return to many times, but without Simon Rogers and Bricks. A classic single that pointed the way forward. Cops can't catch criminals, but what the heck, they're not too bad. The Friends experiment followed and was the Fall's most commercially successful LP, usually looked down on by the Fall Cognoscenti for that very reason. Their cover of the Kinks Victoria was the biggest English chart hit the Fall would ever have. Yet the LP is remarkably low-key for all that success, and as the title suggests, this is an experiment and the LP features a number of them. The narrator of the track Twister does write an autobiography called Renegade G Genius, it is a pity Marky Smith didn't stick with that full title for his actual erratic autobiography. Simon Rogers has his last outing as a full member and also produces some of the LP. Marcia Schofield arrives on keyboards. The most curious friend story, though, is when you realize that the track Athlete Cured is a retread steal of the Spinal Tap number Tonight I'm Gonna Rock You Tonight, and whose unneeded repetition may have influenced one of the Fall's best titles, the Birmingham School of Business School. This was their first LP to make the British Top 20. The opening track, Friends, a melodic bass refrain and Brix's voice, da 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 da, soon joined by Marky Smith's. Friends is an opening of doors and a blueprint for many of the paths that the fall will take over the next decade. The gentle, semi-spoken, simple story will be done far better in upcoming LPs, but this enjoyable tune sets them in the right direction. It's a fairly inauspicious start to the LP, but one that I like. Apparently, Marky Smith had few real friends, and they don't amount to one hand. In 1988, happily married and with a reasonably stable lineup in the group, this may not be a big issue. As things deteriorate in the following years, though, real friends might have helped. I'm gonna tell you about my friends. My friends ain't enough for one hand. This LP is not mellow, though. A fuzzed bass and can-like drum pattern, and you're set for the seven minutes of Bremen Nacht alternative. If you're going to sing about the Germans, you might as well sound like Germans. Inspired by a weird out-of-body experience in a small German club in Bremen, MES thinks he's getting flashbacks to Nazi horrors. Whatever the source, this hypnotic repetition at its best. Again, headphones, a darkened room, maybe a drink, and you're set. Something happened in Bremen. I know something. I don't want to. Something under the ceiling muttered something, and it still shudders. 
On Guest Informant, the opening line, chanted by Bricks, is one of the most poured-over lines in all of Boldham. If it matters to you, the line, according to Bricks, which is between Baghdad State Cog Analyst and Baghdad State Cog Analyst. Suitably enlightened, me neither, but I love hearing Bricks chant behind Marky e. Smith. Bass player Steve Hanley is the male, gruffly distorted voice saying the same line near the beginning. We know that Guest Informant was a magazine found in northeastern hotels in the U.S., a guide to things to do in the area. How that fits in with the lines about wiretapping and hitman, I have no idea, but it's a great ride. I've been split by a first-rate moron.